This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and uh, thank you especially to our speaker this morning. As you can see, our speaker is Dustin Stalo. Dustin is one of our second year fellows in the clinical track, uh, a native Texan med school. You came here at Emory for residency, was a chief resident a few, couple, three years ago uh, at Emory University Hospital, as many may remember, uh, and is a potential budding future electrophysiologist. And he's going to talk to us today about left atrial appendage closure. Dustin. Awesome. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm sure more will um, trail in, which will be fine. Um, there will be a little bit of a rev up in the beginning before we start talking about closure itself. Um, but I think this will be a fruitful topic to spend our time together on today. It'll be a little bit of something for everybody, for the generalists, the imaging folks, um, those who have structural um, and obviously EP inclinations will find um, hopefully some intrigue and um, hopefully some good information on uh, practice patterns. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, minimize these thumbnails and we'll just get off to the races. So today we're gonna to be talking about left atrial appendage closure for stroke prevention. I have no disclosures. Our time today is gonna to break down initially um, walking through a review of our current understanding of the left atrial appendage and how it contributes to stroke in AFib. We're gonna transition um, appropriately in chronologic history of all of this. Um, into an exploration of the surgical approaches to appendage exclusion, uh, and then spend the balance of our time after that on a discussion of percutaneous approaches to appendage closure. Um, spending most of our time talking about Watchman, um, spending some time talking about the Amplitzer cardiac plug uh, slash amulet, the newer generation, um, and um, budding technique uh, more recently um, called the Lariat. Um, so with that, let's just transition into talking about the left atrial appendage, which um, I think can appropriately be called the most fatal attachment to the human body. Um, as we all probably remember from med school uh, embryology, um, the left atrial appendage represents the embryologic remnant of the primitive left atrium. And from that come its rough trabeculations and pectinate muscles as contrasted against the left of the rest of the atria proper, which is more smooth in its contour. Um, it's um, positioned in this high um, value real estate between the mitral valve annulus and the less superior pulmonary vein and in close proximity to the circ. Um, this all becomes very um, relevant when we start talking about um, consideration given to closure approaches. Um, you know, and it's, you know, we could joke that it's somewhat like the appendix um, of some mysterious and minor contribution, but it does uh, and a normal functioning heart can contribute, albeit minorly, to contractility. Obviously, this is lost um, as AFib um, develops um, and structural changes are taken on um, where contractility be begins to be lost. Um, and to some degree, it contributes to naturesis and downstream signaling through RAS. Um, and it's a varied morphology. I, I show here kind of average sizes. Uh, but diameter anywhere from one to three and a half uh, centimeters, length anywhere from two to four and a half, and a wall thickness down to one millimeter. Beyond that, its morphology is very varied. And, um, the, you know, the, the ostium usually is elliptical or oval shape. That's shown here in panel D. To its left, um, panel C depicts a more rounded um, ostium. But we can see the great variety that otherwise is possible with more triangular orifices or um, the right most showing more ovaloid. Beyond that, um, you know, the morphology uh, discussion only gets broader. Uh, when we talk about, um, here we have the chief four morphology shown in CT reconstruction um, and blown out to the sides more anatomic um, pictures. Um, What's most often talked about, I think, for, for fair reason, is the kind of dominant um, windsock morphology that co uh, composes about 50% of the appendages we encounter with this one single dominant lobe that kind of tail, um, tails off. Below that um, is the other oft talked about uh, morphology, this chicken wing um, characterized by this bend in the middle 
um, arising off of this dominant lobe that may give um, rise to a secondary lobe or just more minor contribution. And then more um, kind of interesting morphologies of a kind of a cactus with a, a dominant lobe uh, and secondary lobes branching off or this cauliflower, this kind of just kind of nubbin with um, a bunch of um, kind of odd um, irregular finger-like projections off the edges of it. For what it's worth, there is some um, data out there to suggest that possibly the chicken wing morphology has the lowest um, thromboembolic risk. I, I don't think this is anything that we make clinical decisions off of. It's not something that's factored into typical scoring systems and standard of care is not, you know, TE or, or structural CT to define the morphology to determine clinical care. But all things being equal, we do have good reason to believe that the chicken wing uh, morphology poses the uh, least contribution, uh, least thromboembolic risk here. Um, and kind of part and parcel with that, A and B um, show kind of some of the, the lobes that we often encounter. Uh, the most common is one single lobe, and that's shown here in panel A with a typical uh, windsock morphology. But up to four is not unusual. It's uh, supposed that more lobes may pose a higher uh, risk of stroke. Um, the cactus-like um, morphology is shown here on B uh, with a do single dominant lobe. Uh, and some uh, secondary lobes coming off. And again, just illustrated here is this high value real estate in close proximity to the pulmonary trunk and the left soup. Um, so, you know, it really can't be underscored how dangerous this little bit of tissue can be. Blackshear and Odal in 1996 published some of the best data on this with a review of 23 studies that assessed how the appendage contributes to stroke risk. Um, a, a little bit of a, an asterisk I'll put here that some of this data does come off of autopsy, which you know might not be without its own issues, but a bulk of the patients in this study, um, their thrombi were identified intraoperatively or on TEE. I mean, what they really found um, underscores a lot of the challenges in, in the hopes that closing off the appendage will obviate the need for anticoagulation and eliminate the stroke risk. Because what they found is that when we look at patients that have non-rheumatic atrial fibrillation, only 91% of the thrombi that were found in these studies originated or were totally confined to the uh, left atrial appendage. And that number drops off dramatically when we uh, look at the rheumatic uh, AFib population where it falls down to closer to one in two thrombi. Um, I think this, this is mirrored in what we know about um, our stroke risk scores, um, speaking specifically to non-rheumatic uh, AFib and knowing that uh, rheumatic AFib, their stroke risk here really is um, not adequately predicted on these scoring systems. But regardless, it's a huge problem. And um, you know, it feels like a, a lot of what we see in clinic or in consults and a lot of what we do, um, we, we talk and think about is around AFib because it's increasingly common. Um, in our population over 80 years of age, it's, uh, it afflicts one in 10 adults. Estimates in 2001 um, found about 2.3 folks um, suffering from this and that number is expected to double by uh, 2050. So this topic becomes even more fruitful um, as we uh, and I advance through my career. Um, and stroke is common and 15% of strokes um, are gonna be cardioembolic. And when we, and that is gonna double when we start talking about the population over 80. And unfortunately, stroke can often be the first uh, presentation of otherwise asymptomatic AFib. It makes it very challenging to get out ahead of. Um, and while we talk about <coughs> annual stroke risk um, in a lot of our scoring um, systems, um, lifetime stroke risk really cannot be underscored to be high, high, high. Um, data out of 1991 suggested a stroke risk of one in three. <clears throat> one in three of all patients um, suffering from AFib. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, this problem is only confounded in the fact that while we talk about a straightforward treatment paradigm of risk versus benefit of anticoagulation, um, ultimately landing on a recommendation for anticoagulation, it's not that straightforward because these treatments are not benign. We've all taken care of patients um, that have had challenging perioperative periods, 
We've all taken care of patients that have had devastating complications of anticoagulation with um, fatal or highly debilitating strokes. Um, and even beyond that, um, I think, um, I, I know at least I'm guilty of sometimes wringing my hands um, when talking with patients um, that while they've never suffered a complication, they know someone or fear the complications of um, anticoagulation. So there's a large number of patients that can't tolerate anticoagulation. Um, and hand in hand with that goes a population that often won't. Um, so, you know, it becomes a very fruitful topic to think about alternatives uh, to address uh, this stroke risk and preventing um, what could be a very debilitating problem. I think with that, we'll transition to talking about kind of the more historical, um, you know, where all of this had its origin really was in surgical closures of the left atrium. And this is where a lot of our data comes, comes um, you know, similarly to a lot of what we do from our surgical colleagues. Um, and in general, surgical approaches can be broken down into two approaches. Um, you can take this, the, the more obvious approach of just entirely excising the left atrial appendage and then closing it with sutures or, or uh, staples, however you will. Or, um, and this figure calls it occlusion. Uh, I'll refer to this on these next handful of slides, this option of just kind of closing off but leaving it in place. Um, I'll refer to this option as exclusion. So contrasting exclusion versus excision. And really what we see in the literature is as early as the 30s to 50s, conversation around a variety of options, um, either throwing a line of sutures endocardially, ligating it epicardially, be that with sutures or staples, or maybe, maybe staple exclu uh, exclusion along with some sutures to reinforce it. I'm um, contrasting that, you know, with how you close uh, the re remaining tissue after excision with either sutures or staples. Um, but without standardization of approach, um, it was recognized as early as the, as the 50s that when this is undertaken, only about 50% reduction of stroke risk can be expected. And this really prompted a, a lot of this growing consideration of, around what the best approach might be. How do we select our patients? You know, when to do this, how to do this, who to do this for? And really the literature here really takes off with a good, um, good evaluation that was published in Jack in 2000. Um, and I think the first take home that I find from the literature is that surgical exclusion is often incomplete. This study looked systematically at patients undergoing mitral valve surgery. And what they, they found here is 30% of the appendages that they thought they had closed were incompletely closed, demonstrating spontaneous contrast or thrombus. Um, and while this might just be a surrogate measure for um, prediction of outcomes, they actually were able to see that um, this population still had an over 20% thromboembolic event rate after mitral valve surgery where the appendage was closed. You know, it's not just, this data is not just in mitral valve surgery though. Um, it exists in the cabbage literature as well um, in this study in 2005 of suture versus staple uh, exclusion where both failed. Um, sutures tended to fail in this study over half the time. Uh, and staples tended to fail just over a quarter of the time. So neither of these being highly reassuring, you know, on post-op TEE or whatever measure we find, um, either there's some residual neck of a centimeter um, or there's residual flow, spontaneous contrast or thrombus um, with, with very often, you know, failure defined as a residual jet over five millimeters um, communicating into the appendage. I thought, interestingly, the, the investigators in this study in 2005 weren't entirely discouraged um, because importantly, while it might be an imperfect solution, it didn't increase bypass time. It didn't add to complications and it didn't, didn't add to bleeding. Um, and for what it's worth, there was a significant and short learning curve suggesting that these techniques could be perfected. And all of this being a surrogate for stroke, um, predicting stroke risk, the stroke risk in this study was actually fairly low. So the investigators were in the surgical community really were, were not, not entirely daunted by this, this growing evidence. Um, and instead started to transition to look at best approaches. And I think that brings up the second point that you'll find in the um, surgical literature, that excision outperforms exclusion. This is shown by the investigators at the Cleveland Clinic in 2008, who did a retrospective analysis of their own patients and practice patterns and what they were able to achieve. 
Um, and you can see here that surgical excision failed 27% of the time, whereas suture exclusion failed greater. It was a, a small N in the staple um, um, group that was done there, but all of those failed. And the suture uh, exclusion arm here failed over three quarters of the time. And what the investigators really identified is that when this bit of um, bothersome tissue remains, albeit closed off with staples and sutures, those stature, staples and sutures can erode and the appendage reopens. Uh, and so to some degree, we're falsely reassuring ourselves when our patients present you know, off anticoagulation stating that their appendage is no longer an issue. Um, Lee et al. built off of this in 2013 with their own retrospective study directly comparing exclusion versus excision and found, again, um, um, you know, somewhat reassuringly that the lowest um, stroke risk comes with surgical excision compared to all other techniques. And that they found this, I, I think, reasonably reassuring um, and promising to do a prospective study. Um, and, and, you know, the, this group of investigators, again, uh, did a similar uh, investigation now in a randomized perspective approach published in 2016, comparing uh, suture ligation versus staple, stapler or surgical excision, um, judging success off a of TE. And unfortunately, they found equivalent failure across all arms. Um, even though with intraoperative TE, a lot of these um, failures could be identified and addressed intraoperatively, on follow-up, there was still fairly uniform failure across all of the arms. So the data on surgical closure is not entirely um, clear and decisive, but what I think does arise out of this is that um, just suturing it closed often fails, this can reopen. And then if we're going to take this on, that we're often better simply excising it as shown as in, as shown in this picture. But, but I think interestingly, where, where this subsequently led in the surgical data is exploration of surgical closure devices that um, at least on the surface act, act more similar to exclusion. Um, the appendage remains in place, but now its role just kind of obviated. And there, there have been other systems that came out. I think the Tiger Paw system achieved FDA approval, but ultimately comes off the market due to um, adverse event rates relating to tissue trauma, um, relating to the sharp um, needle barbs that are used to close and anchor, you know, an otherwise um, silicon-based um, clamp. Um, but fortunately, I think we, we see a device rising in prominence, this Atriclip system FDA approved in 2010. And since then, um, this company developing an expanding product line of different sizes, um, and different delivery approaches such that now um, they can accommodate more appendage anatomies. Uh, this procedure can, th this therapy can be used along with cabbage or an open um, aortic or mitral valve um, procedure or as a standalone procedure. So, um, you know, this becomes something that we can refer our patients to, to um, if we don't necessarily buy into percutaneous approaches here um, it, it, it does become an option to just do a simple thoracotomy and place this device, which is, you know, when done with open procedures, adds only around a minute of procedural time. And what this device is, um, it comes off of this, um, this delivery arm. There's this clamp that is composed of two parallel titanium rods situated on a nitinol hinge and lined with this polyester lining. And the benefits here um, over other surgical closures, one, it's rapidly deployable. Um, not only can it be deployed, but you're able to look on uh, intraoperative TEE and if need be reoriented. Um, obviously one of the challenges here intraoperatively, especially on patients on bypass, um, is the anatomy is just uh, uh, is distorted. It, you know, the atrium and the appendage are not fully inflated. So it's, it's very feasible to place a clamp or closure only to find that you've missed some kind of a neck of the appendage and attempts to not um, you know, bother underlying coronary anatomy or get too close to um, the pulmonary trunk. Um, and because you know, the approach here is with a clamp rather than with, with sharp needle barbs, it's able to be safely reapplied, tissue trauma is minimized and there's minimal risk of bleeding. Um, and fortunately, um, beyond this, in the long term, while you know, at its application, it functions as an excluder, um, what happens actually in the long term is this device is able to maintain sufficient force um, that the appendage actually starts to 
atrophy and the device is able to um, reallocate the pressure it delivers. And it ultimately really um, does take the appendage out of the equation. And beyond the stroke risk um, prevention here, do be, do, does become some hope and uh, initial promise that we can also get electrical isolation of the appendage, which for, um, a, for a portion of the AFib population, the firing out of the left atrial appendage um, does contribute to their AFib burden and challenges controlling it. Um, so John Lisko is, a, is appropriately um, on the talk here, will recognize potentially not this post-op um, chest x-ray, but the patient that this comes from. This x-ray comes from a patient just last month um, that most of us got to take care of uh, at EUH. This lady came in for uh, a large left atrial mass that was just swinging around on echo, functionally steno stenosing her valve, um, had actually, uh, actually beat up her pacer wires um, which you know, are part of her initial presentation uh, because she had a pacing system in place for congenital heart block um, and had some uh, interesting fluoro pictures of it just kind of swinging around. Ultimately, this woman, woman went um, to the OR with Dr. Danishman, had her um, pacing system uh, surgically extracted, had the mass surgically extracted, had her tricuspid uh, and mitral valves intervened on, and just a quick addition to her surgery, and, and you can see here what this device looks like on chest x-ray, uh, had an atric clip placed. Um, and I, I think for her, you know, this is, this is probably a, a good thing to have undergone because what we've seen is in a 2019 systematic review for this device specifically, a high success rate. So a, a cohort and aggregate of over 900 patients achieving almost, uh, you know, approaching 100% occlusion of the appendage without any adverse related events. Um, and while over, you know, about 60% of the patients studied here ultimately ceased anticoagulation, we see a very, uh, uh, or at least relatively low stroke risk um, post-clip um, down around 1% per patient or per 100 patient years. Um, so I, I think this is a, a blossoming um, and increasingly promising approach um, that we can offer for patients. But at the end of the day, um, a lot of this is new and I think potentially the guidelines will catch up. Um, but the American and European guidelines agree on a 2B recommendation here, saying that surgical exclusion or uh, occlusion of the left atrial appendage may be considered for stroke prevention in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. Um, but ultimately the, the European guidelines speak to a class one recommendation here to continue anticoagulation in this population. And this becomes relevant. I, in, in my first year of fellowship at Grady, um, I had two different consults on two different um, consult months from neuro of patients that came in for devastating strokes off of anticoagulation um, with some unknown history of a surgical closure of their appendage. Um, and the question often arises, well, you know, if the appendage is closed, should we, um, should we put them back on anticoagulation? I think that's obvious once they've already had a stroke, um, but you know, upfront the guidelines suggest that these patients shouldn't have come off of anticoagulation. And I think just to finally drive this point home, I think I would boil it down to a consideration for surgical closure, um, but to really think twice before discontinuing anticoagulation and to be a little bit bolder, almost to make a statement of excise it or don't bother, because if it's left behind, it can reopen. Obviously, with honorable mention and a giant asterisk for the atric clip, which um, I find personally to be pretty promising. We'll transition from here um, into percutaneous closure devices. Um, a lot of the drive here and knowledge here building off of the um, surgical data uh, and what we learned um, historically on that. Um, and, you know, coming into this, um, I think most of us only hear about Watchmen. Um, a more superficial dive will lead you to talking about Watchmen or the um, Anplatzer cardiac plug slash amulet. But really, um, the first device here uh, deployed in humans was the Plato device, which has, uh, which, you know, was first utilized in 2001, but has since come off the market. Um, giving way to Watchmen and the Amplancer cardiac plug and their second generation equivalents, uh, Amulet first and then the Watchmen Flex. Both of these aiming to address some design challenges to stability and deployment uh, in hopes of improving outcomes. Uh, 
But the story really doesn't under uh, doesn't end there because anybody um, with, with with significant motivation to get into this game seems to be getting into it um, with you know the Wavecrest device coming out, Oculatech uh, and the Lombre, all of these being in clinical use in Europe, um, albeit in in small amounts, and the, them all having their own design innovations with supposed benefits. And even beyond these, um, some devices like the UltraSil, the Sideris patch and the PFM uh, device, which have um, yet unproven benefit um, and are still pending clinical investigation. All of these uniformly had, had pretty similar deployment approaches. They all are done entirely endovascularly, percutaneously involving a, a transeptal uh, puncture um, and leaving behind some kind of a foreign body to occlude the appendage. Uh, and we'll, we'll end our time today talking about um, devices that deviate from that with an epicardial or a hybrid approach. approach. The Lariat device is gonna get a, a significant balance of our time at the end. Um, and that, is, that device is gonna marry uh, a, a transeptal puncture along with pericardial access to deliver um, uh, appendage ligation epicardially and kind of, uh, and I'll show a picture of the Sierra ligation system, but this is gonna be an entirely epicardial approach. Um, but what you'll see in practice, especially in America is nearly uniformly watchmen. Um, but when you look at the literature and what's on our horizon, it's a lot of watchmen, amulet and larian. And so that's where we'll talk today. Shown here are kind of pictorial representations of, of these, of the devices themselves. The big players on this top row of Watchmen and the Amplatzer cardiac plug, along with their second generation devices, uh, the Amulet um, bringing in some design um, changes, and the Watchmen uh, Flex being on uh, the horizon with different design of, um, you know, it's nitinol um, cage and, and just morphology changes. Shown here is the initial um, uh, innovator here of Plato, and a lot of the other devices that are kind of. Um, potentially coming into um, practice, kind of these Me Too devices that have their own small device innovations and proposed benefits. We'll end our time, like I said, talking about the Larry at this kind of epicardially deployed um, suture. And in a similar modification of this um, with less data, um, the Sierra ligation system deploys a similar epicardial suture, but instead of a transeptal uh, puncture, um, to guide, a guide the delivery system. There's actually a, just a second, um, second device is deployed in the epicardium um, that's able to sense the atrial signals um, to differentiate um, epicardial fat from atrial tissue proper and therein know that, that you kind of latched on to uh, myocardium and just not fat. So the watchman, I, um, you know, if, if if you've not seen one of these or looked into what it is, it's essentially a, a roughly spherically shaped device that is, comes in five sizes um, from down from 21 millimeters up to 33 millimeters um, to fit atria that are just um, a couple millimeters smaller that when sized at the ostium because there's a degree of over expansion that is necessary for stability. Uh, stability here comes from these act, 10 active fix, fixation barbs um, that come off of this nitinol cage um, after it's all expanded radially within the appendage. And here in comes some possibility for tissue trauma and complications that we'll talk about. All of this being covered with this kind of polyester PET membrane um, that you know, in the period immediately post um, deployment before the device is fully endothelialized is gonna serve to catch um, thrombi that are seen there. And so it's, it's not entirely uncommon and you know, really it should be expected uh, but we'll, we, we'll get asked this often, patients with a watchman will end up getting a CT uh, and very often a CT read will note this concerning thrombus within the left atrium. Um, but you know, suffice it to say, so long as closure is achieved um, appropriately, that, that device is safely, uh, the, the thrombus is safely contained within the atrium. Um, and we see you know, kind of the, this screw at the top that is used in the deployment um, somewhat recessed down Contrast that from you know, a little bit different approach um, with the amplats or cardiac plug and the amulet, the first generation and second generation devices on the left and the right with the, the second generation device on the right, the amulet 
having some design changes with you know more fixation um, structure, a little bit larger waist. This articulating disc, it's hard to appreciate here. This screw attachment now is recessed to, to hopefully address some thromboembolic risk from that. Um, but in general, an entirely different approach to closing, closing off the appendage instead of this kind of um, spherical uh, device that is implanted, a now more kind of disc and lobe approach of this disc that sits um, and occludes the appendage uh, and then, a, or sorry, a lobe that occludes the appendage and then a disc that snugs up to cover the ostium. You know, despite difference, differences in how they achieve what they aim to achieve, their deployment is pretty similar. Um, and I'll take a minute of our time just to, you know, show a demonstration cartoon of this um, and talk through the procedure. I, I think their venous axis might come in a little bit low. It's hard to tell from the angle, but um, venous axis down in the leg um, coming up with the guide wire to the atrium to prepare for transeptal puncture. You're gonna see that they, they punch across the septum. Um, at this point, you know, achieve a therapeutic ACT over 200. Um, you know, plant your guide wire in a safe place, usually the left superior uh, pulmonary vein, change out your transeptal uh, sheath for the, the device sheath. A pigtail finds its home in the appendage, the device comes out radially expands all of this, you know, can't be underscored the importance of CT here in sizing, can't be underscored the, the, the need for angiography, pressure guidance and TEE for device sizing and application. Um, but ultimately what, what is demonstrated here in the last several frames is that this device uh, endothelializes off, okay? So that's all fun and cool, um, but you know, does it achieve what we want it to achieve? Well, you know, part and parcel with the reason that Watchmen is, is what we're predominantly seeing. And, you know, at the VA, I think the consult for this is um, referral for Watchmen evaluation instead of appendage closure. Um, that's because Watchmen's the only device that has, has had FDA approval in the US. The other devices have been approved for the similar governing body in Europe. Um, but this really comes off of um, RCT data that only exists for Watchmen. And that comes in the form initially of Protect AF. Um, which was published in 2009 and aimed to show non-inferiority versus warfarin. Um, so this was a population over 700 patients, um, a CHADS2 score, so not a CHADS2 VASC, but a CHADS2 score of one, you know, somewhat akin to a CHADS2 VASC of two. These patients randomized in a two to one fashion between device and the cumin and arm and followed up for 18 months with the primary outcome of stroke, a, of a composite of stroke, systemic embolism and death death being cardiovascular specifically or unexplained death. Um, and, you know, by package insert, by a device manufacturer recommendations, these patients are leaving on anticoagulation. They're coming, at, coming back at 45 days um, on anticoagulation until, you know, adequate seal is demonstrated on a TEE by a residual jet less than five millimeters uh, of, of flow into the appendage at which point um, patients can come off of anticoagulation and transition to dual antiplatelet therapy. You know, if they can't come off of anticoagulation uh, at that time, uh, you know, they're free to come off, you know, on subsequent TE when device closure is demonstrated. And after that six month mark, you know, um, supposing that closure is demonstrated, patients are continued on aspirin only. I mean, to, to that degree, this initial trial showed an 88% uh, of the devices could be implanted. And at the end of the day, over three quarters of patients came off of an anticoagulation. I think this is, this is um, you know, less than we were hoping for. This is early in the device's um, use, um, but it's still not a nothing intervention here even early on. And to speak to that, the, the not nothingness, they did achieve their non-inferiority here. So this is really the meat that Watchmen um, builds, build, starts to build its reputation off of is a reduction in, in, all, in, in this composite outcome with three versus almost five events per 100 patient years. And that really comes in the form of, of a reduction in cardiovascular unexplained death. The original trial doesn't show a benefit of all cause mortality, but shown here in panel D um, is a visual trend towards it, you know, approaching a relative risk reduction of 40%. 
and they do demonstrate a, a reduction in strokes, especially, especially in hemorrhagic strokes. But interestingly, in this initial trial, there's a signal for actually increasing ischemic strokes, which becomes interesting because closure is nice. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is preventing strokes. Um, and, you know, the majority of strokes are going to be ischemic. So the fact that, you know, this device is lending itself to increase ischemic stroke bears further investigation. Um, and I think that that investigation really is spoken to when we talk, talk about safety outcomes here, being worse in the device arm versus the vitamin K antagonist, uh, um, cumin and warfarin arm with an almost 8% complication rate per 100 patient years, up from you know, just over 4% in the non-device arm. A lot of these obviously are procedural re related complications and they're significant early on. And this, this lent a lot of concern amongst operators because there's this high degree of pericardial effusion and tamponade that requires drainage. Um, and there's this 1% stroke risk periprocedurally, which ultimately is borne out uh, to be attributable to kind of um, early understanding uh, and techniques around deployment, um, where an uh, air might not entirely be flushed out of the system or might find its way sucked into the patient. Um, but ultimately, you know, this air embolizing off, the ischemic strokes from these air emboli tended to not be significant. Um, there's also a small risk of air embolism traveling anatomically uh, into the root and up the right coronary artery just because of its anterior takeoff. But because of all of these concerns, the FDA um, mandates further study, and we get our second randomized control trial on Watchmen coming in the form of Prevail, uh, coming out in 2014. And really what this was designed to do was to demonstrate safety. It really was a secondary concern, um, albeit not a soft concern in hopes of uh, confirming the efficacy, but the, the trial was not designed um, to confirm efficacy, um, because there's a lot of design differences here that are going to challenge their ability to confirm the efficacy. One, you know, the patient population is 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 just under half or just over half of the preceding PROTECT trial. The patients are a little bit higher risk and stroke. They're still randomized in a two to one fashion, but they're only followed up for 12 months. So all these things are going to make it harder to detect a difference between event rates between the device and the Coumadin um, control. They continue, uh, you know, they put out their two co-primary endpoints, the first being a continuation from PROTECT of this composite of stroke systemic embolism or cardiovascular slash unexplained death. And a second one aiming to show a benefit in reduction of stroke or ischemic, uh, or sorry, ischemic stroke or systemic embolism in the one week post-procedure period. And to, that, to the second point, they do achieve that. But to the first point, they, they actually fall short of confirming the ethics. And I want to take a moment before we start talking about the safety profile shown here about what really is going on here. Um, because this lends, this leads to a lot of the ambiguity, I think, and um, guidelines and our understanding of the benefit and risk of this procedure. Um, because yes, they did fail on this first primary outcome where the original trial demonstrated non-inferiority you know, this first primary outcome really is, is of no, no notable difference between the two groups. Um, you know, I, I think teasing that out, um, it's got to be recognized that this is a high risk group. So Chad's VAS scores of over four in average, but this vitamin K uh, antagonist arm, the Coumadin arm here, really, these are super performers. It, it's really a bit unusual. Their stroke risk um, on Coumadin being down sub 1%, you know, in the face of this Chad's VAS score, this is, these patients were super, for, super performers of some variety. Um, and I, I think that point um, can't be underscored enough, especially when you think if trials like Rely, trials like Rockets AF, trials like Aristotle that have shown non-inferiority of DOACs, if the vitamin K and, and if the Coumadin, Coumadin arm had shown a similar stroke risk. Those devices never, uh, those, our, our DOEX would have never passed this, okay? And really what this illustrates is, is a, a small population here on Coumadin. You know, it's only a third of the 400 patients. Um, and because of this, we get wide confidence intervals and, and, and driving home this point of a low um, point confidence uh, estimate. But to speak about the safety, which really was the point of this trial,
really across the board safety endpoints were cut in half. The overall procedure rate drops down um, to four and a half. The pericardial effusion and tamponade risk is cut in half down to two. And we start to see mitigation of this procedural related stroke risk. Um, and really that has been borne out in the story when we, we talk about Watchmen in its infancy through all these trials, such as the continued access registries, ASAP, which looked at um, aspirin and plavix in this group over anticoagulation. We then marched through to, to prevail and its continued access registry, the European study evolution and more contemporaneous US and Canadian cohorts. We see dramatic um, drops off, dropping off of procedural complications. So I think we should feel increasingly confident in the safety of Watchmen. Not that it's not without its own risk, but it is increasingly safe. Um, but I think fortunately what we don't have to do is cherry pick an outcome for protect to show efficacy and, a, um, and, and then to, to cherry pick the data we want from Prevail to show the safety. Uh, and actually, I think just under two years ago now, we get five-year data out demonstrating a combined cohort that really looks like the, the patients we seek to do this device in, people over 70, high stroke risk with, with Chad's VASC, you know, approaching for a varied AFib patterns. And this really is the data I, I think we should look to when we talk to patients about appendage closure with Watchmen, when we talk to them earnestly about what they can expect. What we see in analysis of this cohort is that there, there, is a, there is a demonstration of benefit in cardiovascular and unexplained, be, uh, unexplained death. And really this is driven home by a reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. Beyond that, and what I think is important to patients, and I think if I were in a patient's shoes thinking about this or thinking about this for a loved one of mine, you know, a stroke risk is what it is and, and no stroke is a good stroke. But what I think patients fear, um, you know, or very reasonably maybe or should fear are fatal strokes and potentially beyond that, the disabling strokes. I think if I were in this group, that's what I would fear is not necessarily a stroke that you know, takes, takes, me, takes me off this planet quietly in my sleep, but instead one that leaves me a shell of myself to be cared for my, for my family, just to put out there my big fears in life. That is one of them. Um, um, so I, I think Watchmen is a great success here in preventing hemorrhagic stroke and fatal strokes. I mean, it can't be underscored the importance um, of getting patients off of anticoagulation because here we see a benefit in Watchmen um, and reduction in non-procedure related major bleeding, okay? And I think, again, just to, to speak, because we, we have to keep coming back to this, this stroke risk. Why is this stroke risk not different um, between Coumadin and Watchmen? I think this is... Um, this is still um, the prevail cohort muddying the waters shown here. And I, again, this is not a perfect comparison and is not device versus Coumadin. What, what this graph shows is expected stroke risk and untreated AF in blue. We see expected stroke on patients treated with warfarin um, with the x-axis showing, you know, um, stratification out by Chad's vascore. And shown here um, are the event rates and all of these trials with their respective confidence intervals. Um, and all of them at worst straddle um, the, the impact of warfarin. Um, so I, I, do, I, I do find this, this chart and data and paper um, to suggest to me that we are, despite what is seen in Prevail, we are um, driving home a benefit in ischemic stroke that at least mirrors warfarin um, and starts to bring in more benefits uh, in terms of disabling stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and all-cause mortality. Um, you know, beyond this, we could talk about the, um, the, a big trial out of Europe. I won't belabor this too much, um, but what they sought in Europe in this evolution study is a multi-center prospective non-randomized non trial. So none of the, all of these patients underwent device implantation. These were all high-risk patients, but they really were incredibly saturated with patients had anticoagulation contraindications, which really are the attractive patients for this procedure, right? So these are patients that have survived a hemorrhagic stroke or significant bleeding events. Um, and just again, you know, they show a high implant success rate. They show low adverse event rates. And despite what the package insert would suggest that patients should be continued on oral anticoagulation through 45 days, uh, if not beyond for demonstration of appendage occlusion, only a quarter of these patients left on anticoagulation and a lot left simply on antiplatelet therapy, 
the bird, the, the bulk of them leaving on DAPT, but many of them leaving on SAPT. And I guess I dropped off the number, but there's a not zero number of patients actually leaving on nothing. Um, and through that lens, looking at the outcomes they achieved and major bleeding versus what would be expected with VKA, we see significant reductions in major bleeding in all comers and those with prior stroke, but those with prior hemorrhagic stroke or history of major bleeding. And compared to the ischemic stroke risk expected by Chad's VAS score, um, this study again, albeit patients not leaving on anticoagulation, still have significant reductions in ischemic strokes across all of these groups. I think an interesting conversation to be had off of this paper is what to do about anticoagulation because we see significant deviation um, uh, in anticoagulation. Shown here in, on the right is um, what is done, what was done in the population with this frontmost bar being the immediate post implant and marching back through first discontinuation and then out to two year follow-up. And what we see is particularly in the attractive, quote unquote, attractive uh, closure candidates, those that have survived major bleeding, those that have survived a, a prior hemorrhagic stroke, many of these patients are leaving on nothing. Many of these patients are leaving on single anti platelet therapies. The bulk of them aren't leaving on anticoagulation and they are rapidly transitioning to single antiplatelet therapy, okay? And there's no randomized controlled data necessarily showing the safety and efficacy, efficacy of this. You know, the safety profile of antiplatelet therapy here and not anticoagulation really is spoken to in this study as well as the ASCP study. Um, but I, I think, you know, trial data on this would be helpful um, because I don't know that I'm comfortable with this, but it's, it is the reality of many of our patients that even a 45 day period of anticoagulation could be problematic. Um, and to that effect though, we also now have to have a conversation about device associated or device related thrombus. Um, it um, fortunately is a rare occurrence and this trial was found to be 4% and other trials down to around one and a half percent. And importantly, not relating to anticoagulation regimen. I don't know that that bears out to be truth or just a, um, just a result of small event rates. But what, what wasn't seen was a relationship to the anticoagulation regimen. So similar event rates for device-related thrombi on patients leaving on single antiplatelet therapies, leaving on DAPT, leaving on DOAX, leaving on Coumadin. Um, and in this trial, they showed 34 device-related thrombi. Only 21 of these were treated. You know, some of these were found to be mobile, but some of these were felt to be small, thin, non-mobile, flat. Um, with patients that were at high risk. And so a handful of these weren't treated and were instead just followed um, and many, most of them resolving. And again, I, I won't even belabor this point because I think it really just speaks to the low event rate, but there was no significant impact of device related thrombus on ultimately observed stroke TIA systemic embolization risk. Um, I won't speak, we'll, we'll transition into speaking very briefly about the AMPLATS or cardiac plug in the second generation amulet. I won't speak on it too much, um, really, be, because the data tells the same story, uh, along with an absence of RCT data and data that is less robust. And really the best data coming from uh, a recently published trial of a two-year prospective study out of uh, Europe um, in a high-risk population. Um, but again, similarly, high success rate with implant, high um, success rate with sealing, low risk of procedural complications and a significant benefit in ischemic stroke and similar device related thrombi to Watchman. Um, and where I showed the previous chronologic um, evolution of procedural stroke, uh, pr procedural complication, similar observations have been made in this device. You know, we could postulate differences and benefits um, in device design and how this lends to success we could see. And we could talk about appendage factors and device related factors, ultimately coming down to the semi spherical device versus the disc and lobe approach. There's some um, theorized benefits here in morphology and size where with Watchman because of its, uh, its shape, you really need a depth that is um, similar to, if not greater than its width, because you really have to fit the device entirely down in there. So you're, con you're confined and challenged in shallow appendages because you really need an osseal width, uh, or sorry, a depth of 17 to 31 millimeters. Whereas the amulet you really only required because of this lobe design uh, 
a depth of 12 millimeters. So potentially amulet may be more beneficial in shallow appendages. And um, I'll be at a complex conversation because amulet is sized off of this landing zone a centimeter back while, um, while watchman is sized off the ostium. Um, you know, there's suggestion here that amulet will fit smaller uh, appendages that might not fit a watchman um, because of the smaller allowance of a landing zone of 11 um, millimeters versus the, an osteal diameter of uh, 17 millimeters. There are some, you know, possible device factors here. People would postulate that this disc and lobe approach better seals off the, the appendage and better seals off the osteum. And for what it's worth, um, this device actually is marketed for use without anticoagulation. Um, but I, I don't think we will have, have to hypothesize differences here for all that long because um, Amulet ID is a trial currently in the works. It's randomized at 150 sites of almost 2000 patients um, with a five year follow up. And, follow -up. and here we're gonna get one to one comparison of Watchmen versus Amulet. They're gonna go head to head in a similar patient population. Enrolling several years ago and should actually conclude um, enrollment this year. And so we should be seeing final data in a handful of years, looking at prior outcomes that Watchmen similarly looked at and prevail with this, this um, composite outcome of stroke, and, uh, of stroke death and complication, um, a, a, a combination of ischemic stroke versus uh, systemic embolization, and also a one-to-one -one comparison for device closure at 45 days. I think this trial will be interesting to see, and I, I eagerly await what they find. So that'll, that'll, be, that, that'll be all we'll talk about for endocardial approaches, and we'll spend the balance of our time talking about lariat much I, I think it's really interesting, um, albeit even more challenging with a little bit more uh, limited data. So Larry, it's a device that initially found its, um, found its home and canine models coming over to human feasibility, feasibility in 2011 and since then being implanted and shy of 5,000 patients. And it really comes across as an alternative for left atrial anatomies that aren't suitable for endoclo endocardial closure, as well as patients in whom um, their anticoagulation candidacy is unsuitable. So if you don't wanna deviate from package instructions um, to put your patient on at least 45 days of anticoagulation, Lariat might be an attractive option here. Um, a little caveat here, they do have FDA approval for this device, but under a broader implication, the FDA has approved this device for a to deliver a pre-tied stitch for surgical soft tissue approximation, which isn't not what the device is, is achieving. Um, but the FDA did subsequently come out um, off of some registry data and say, yo, everyone, just as a reminder, um, this has not been proven for appendage closure. Um, and really what this is, is kind of a two-part system with a transeptal device coming across with a magnetic guide wire and an endocath balloon and pericardial access to get your suture delivery device and ultimately marrying these two across a mag, uh, ma magnetic guide wires that create a rail system. Um, and shown here is what this looks like under fluoro. Again, you know, part and parcel with this conversation is um, a lot of interesting um, work and, and contribution to uh, by imagers here um, because you know, it really does require a marrying of angiography and TEE with a significant contribution by CT work um, on device selection and uh, delivery. So I got a picture here, so a, a video. So obviously it's gonna start with pericardial access. If you can't get pericardial access or that is challenged, you're just, you know, it's, you're dead in the water. You can't continue. You come up across with transeptal access, okay? And so out here comes a 025 magnetized guide wire that finds its home in the tip of the appendage. Out here comes the endocath balloon. Um, all this under, again, TE guidance. It's going to find the ostium. And what you're going to see coming up here um, in the bottom right of the screen now um, is our delivery system for the suture. Is, or sorry, first coming up with an 035 uh, magnetized guide wire to, to marry up with the um, endocardial wire to create this magnetized rail. The suture is gonna come out. It's gonna be snugged up over the appendage. 
the balloon's going to be inflated to demonstrate, you know, correct placement and aid, um, you know, safe, safe stability at the net, um, at the orifice. Um, the device is going to be snugged down as best as possible. All of our junk in the um, appendage is going to um, find its way on out before ultimately um, even more firm pressure is brought on and the device really is, uh, um, the appendage really is just kind of strangulated off now. Um, and you'll see in the coming frames um, after the suture cut, cutting device is brought up and cut out, cut out and everything comes out of the patient, the patient's ultimately going to go home and this very taut pressure is going to be maintained the appendage is going to, um, you know, start to become ischemic and wither away. And what we see on device follow-up here and demonstrated in these coming pictures is that this ligated appendage really just atrophies off, okay? So this really speaks to a lot of the benefits that are possible here potentially versus Watchman. Like I said already, you know, this might be an attractive alternative because we don't have to leave an uh, internal foreign body and the implications on anticoagulation there become important. Um, we see differences in anatomy that might be suitable here. And when we think about all the pericardial complications that come with percutaneous closure, otherwise, it is somewhat of a benefit to go into this, um, the high risk portions with pericardial access in case of complication. Um, and beyond the, the implications for stroke prevention with you know, achieving atrophy of the appendage, uh, we'll conclude our time talking about some of the antiarrhythmic benefit here. It's, it's not a perfect solution. It does have its own challenges with anatomy, right? This, this um, kind of lasso shape is only so large. So multilobulated uh, appendages or appendages with widths over four centimeters can be challenging to get it get over. Um, but you know, if the appendage is superiorly oriented or its apex sits around behind the pulmonary trunk, it can be challenging to get up there and similar challenges with posteriorly rotated hearts. Again, the importance of TEE uh, um, and CT for uh, uh, procedure planning here. Pericardial access might be a benefit in, in, in case of complication, but it is its own problem because it is another access site to have complications with. And it does, um, for patients that have had prior cardiac surgery and might have pericardial adhesions, pericardial access can be challenging. And even if you can get in there, maneuverability can be challenging. So for our post-cabbage patient, patient population, this might not be as attractive of an option. But what do we see in outcomes? Well, early on, um, just to surmise, I think we see good efficacy with a questionably rocky safety profile. Price et al. in 2014 put out a small cohort which showed good device closure, uh, 81%. Um, you know, it could be better. But at the price of a 10% complication rate, um, with 2% of the population here needing to go for emergent surgery. And some, uh, I think there were deaths actually noted in this cohort. Miller et al. publishes a similarly high risk population, albeit smaller, and achieving 93% uh, acute closure of the appendage, now at the expense of a 9% rate of left atrial appendage perforation and a 20% risk of pericardial complications of effusion, tamponade, and early and late pericarditis. Um, but as in most devices uh, and therapies and treatments across the board, the learning curve for this has been um, very promising and there have been technique modifications. Largely the replacement of the pericardial axis with a large bore needle transitioning over to a micropuncture needle, which is much more forgiving um, Lacaretti at all has been very, uh, Lacquer, Dr. Lacaretti has been very instrumental in publications on this topic in 2016, publishing a cohort of seven, over 700 patients that shows a halving with these changes of the complication rates um, and improvements over time um, with implementation of a uh, micropuncture needle, which is more forgiving and colchicine, which starts to eliminate some of the uh, pericarditis risk here. Um, a difference, uh, a, a reduction in, uh, sorry, an improvement in closure. We also see um, a similar trial, uh, a, a different trial trying to compare Washman versus Lariat. It's imperfect data, but Lariat is suggested to have less and smaller leaks while equal rates of stroke are seen. And I think an interesting thing to talk about here is um, a, another publication by Lacaretti et al that there's benefit here in lariat reducing AFib burden. So in, uh, in a patient population undergoing lariat versus a plus PVI versus a matched cohort of ablation only, uh, 
the patients that had addition of Lariat to their treatment plan um, were able to achieve improved freedom um, from a atrial tachycardia and AFib off of anti uh, AADs. Uh, and for what it's worth, not that it's clinically significant to, to add eight weeks um, longer to time to recurrence, um, but I think interestingly here, this, this cohort showed similar rates of improvement in FID burden between patients with and without leaks. And to that effect, um, one of the last points I'll make is to be on the lookout for the AMAZE trial, um, which hopefully will be coming out in December of 2021, which will seek in a randomized fashion to demonstrate what was shown in that cohort, randomizing two to one Lariat plus PVI versus PVI alone with similar outcomes as we've talked about before, freedom from AFib, and secondarily a compositive stroke and systemic embolism. Um, so just to start wrapping it up, um, just like our surgical colleagues, our percutaneous approaches carry a 2B recommendation. A lot of this um, reflecting kind of murkiness and back and forth in data, uh, but it has not been borne out to be the perfect solution we've, we, we've sought. But I do think the sum of what we've talked about today and what I've found does lend in my mind um, a suggestion that it really does help people. Um, and just to finish, um, kind of take home points, um, man, AFib and stroke, huge risk, mitigating this um, being a very necessary and fruitful area of study. It's a huge population we talk about and it's complex. Surgical closure is imperfect. Surgical excision versus new sur surgical closure devices probably went out. Um, especially consideration being given to Atriclip. And just a reminder, closure is not assured. So really think twice before getting your patient off of anticoagulation, especially if you don't know what their closure was. Um, and with percutaneous closure, I think, you know, there are mixed signals, but I think the, the bulk of the data suggests benefit. Um, and this is a, a, a therapy. I, I think that when I come out into practice independently, um, I'll have um, great hopes for. Um, but, you know, I think the future is ripe here. We're, we're going to start talking more and seeing more about what the best approach might be, who the optimal patient might be, and better understanding how we approach anticoagulation uh, in this population, especially regards to NOACs. Um, and then just one final plug to be on the lookout for Amulet IDE and Amaze coming out in the coming years. With that, I'll end. I, I, I think I'm already over time, but I'd love to field some questions um, if we have time. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, very good uh, review of a expansive topic. Uh, a couple, I'll just a couple quick points. I know we're, we're short on time, and so we can maybe do like maybe one or two quick questions. I just have a couple points. One is uh, continue to be reminded in a lot of these talks and trials about that warfarin is still a very, all, despite all its issues and. Um, uh, inconvenience, still a very effective treatment for stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. So, uh, absolutely. Yep. So, so, in sorry right, if I'm in the right scenario. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah Robbie. No, you you mentioned Andy. it. Go ahead. Robbie, this is Andy. And just another comment is that a very high CHADS VAS2 score um, is a risk for stroke even in patients who do not have atrial fibrillation. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, one, one thing is that I, I think this procedure, the Lariat and Watchman both um, require shared decision-making model of discussion with an independent uh, cardiologist, you know, when people ask us, what does a procedure do? Often um, the response is what it actually does in the lab or whatever, but the, the, the discussion needs to be that this will reduce a certain type of stroke. And that's predominantly bleeding stroke from being on blood thinners it's not going to reduce outcomes of, of stroke necessarily uh, in these high-risk patients. And all their other risk factors need to be addressed. So, um, you know, for those who 
uh, are going to be stamping out stroke in the EP lab. Uh, they are also needs to be the follow up that these patients are getting all the other treatments that prevent uh, ischemic stroke. Yeah, excellent point. All right, well, agreed. And for the sake of time, I think we'll wrap up there. I would encourage any of you with other pressing questions, just page Dr. Stalo directly. S-T-A-L-O-C-H. Please, Give him a page please. right now. Blow up his yeah. pager. He'll be happy to. He'll be happy to go into further detail. But I'm on, I'm on the lookout. Thank you, Dustin. Thank everyone for uh, tuning in today. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.